I strongly recommend that you don't look back. Welcome to the Film Start Podcast. I am Chris Gore. It's my favorite month of the year. It's October, where a lot of great independent horror films come out. I'm sure if you're like me, you're feasting on all the cool new horror films that are coming out this month. It seems like I find out about a great new one every day. Um, if you're a fan of the Final Destination series of films, Jeffrey Reddick. Jeffrey, how are you today? Hey, I'm doing well. How are you, Chris? Now, um, you are the director of Don't Look Back, which we're going to talk about. But Final Destination, you were involved as one of the writers on that series. Is that correct? Yeah, I actually um, came up with the story and wrote the first draft. So I basically I came up with the idea. I worked at New Line Cinema, the studio that made the film. So um, they bought my story and had me write the first draft of the script. And um, then we brought on James Wong and Glenn Morgan uh, to rewrite and, and shoot it and the and then I also wrote the story for the second one. So I was there for the birth of the baby, basically. <laughs> well, can, I, can I just say um, how much I enjoyed those films? They're fun, right? I mean, the whole premise, it's sort of like this sort of winding, like, I love when they tease, when you tease the audience with like, is this going to happen? And then it yeah. doesn't happen, you know? So a lot of jump scares, a lot of fun, and a lot of the most creative deaths in cinema. I would say. I would agree. I think um, it's been a lot of fun. I'm, I'm really proud of of the franchise. And, you know, after the second one, kind of seeing it, seeing how other people kind of brought their twists and turns on the on the on the concept. It's been really exciting to to have a, you know, just as a horror fan myself. It's just such an honor to have something that that you started and created kind of become part of the zeitgeist. You know, sometimes I'll be out and I'll hear somebody get just walking by with their friend and something will happen. They'll be like, oh, that was a final destination moment. And I'm like, <laughs> inside, I'm like, woohoo. <laughs> <laughs> well, Don't Look Back in a way kind of is a sister, I, I, you might say, to the series of Final Destination films. It, it feels related to it in the sense that it's about that, uh, it's about, I think it takes the concept a little deeper because it's about the regret uh, of your actions or or lack of action, so to speak. It, right. it kind of begins yeah. with viral moment capturing. And I always wonder this for myself, whenever you see people that are videoing a moment that is terrible to see, and then yeah. they don't do anything, you think, well, what would I do in that situation? Would I be paralyzed with fear? Um, is this, I mean, it is sort of a, a, an evolution of the concept for Don't Look Back. Can, can you tell me what, what went into that? What went into kind of the thinking of, of this, I, I assume could be a new series of films? Yes. Um, you know what? It's, it's interesting with, with Final Destination, you know, I really wanted to tap into, because I think a lot of the best genre films are films that tap into real human emotion. And with Final Destination, it was like the fear of death and you know, especially young people, you know, when we're young, we're, we're silly. We, we think we're going to live forever. So we're, we have no concept of our own mortality. And with Don't Look Back, you know, I was really influenced a lot by the Kitty Genovese story. I heard that when I was younger, she was a young woman who was assaulted in an apartment complex in New York. And the story at the time was that nobody, like 30 or 40 people watched and nobody helped. And, you know, we studied it in class about the bystander effect. And, um, so that story always stuck with me, how people could stand by and not help. And we've all been in situations. It's a, just a, like you said, we've all been in situations. And I don't expect people to like risk their lives to help people. But as I've gotten older, I've, and especially with the advent of cell phones, I see people recording stuff. But it's like, did you call 911 first? And, you know, most people don't even think to like do anything. And so that lack of kind of apathy has really started to like, you know, bother me. So I wanted to kind of delve into like the repercussions of what if, you know, our inactions kind of come back to haunt us and kind of the disconnect between people that that exist now in society. So, you know, I wanted to play with like, you know, you don't know if it's a killer that's after them. You don't know if it's if it's karma. You don't know if it's in our, our lead character, Caitlin's mind. So it let me play with a lot more themes. Um, you know, a lot of, I, you know, I, I stuck a lot in there. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully it all came together seamlessly because I did want to, you know, I was kind of dealing with a lot of themes. Um, within a genre film, which is what I love about our genre is that you can do that. 
Well, it, it, it did keep me guessing un until the end, uh, for sure. I, I don't want I don't want to get into anything in the third act, but I've always loved this this concept, and I think that you took it a lot further with this, especially with the advent of social media. I mean, it's hard also to judge people in that situation, um, but I think that this this is say a more culturally relevant or timely. Um, final destination, in a sense. Um, your lead actress is fantastic. I, I, I feel like have I seen her in anything before? Is she? She had a, she had a small role in. Um, she had a small role in. Um, it's so funny because I keep wanting to look at you, but my camera's up here, so I'm trying, oh. <laughs> I'm trying to keep. Just look oh, wherever. Man. Wherever, <laughs> man. <laughs> uh, but no, she had a small part in It Follows. But um, I am so happy I I I found her because she's she's an amazingly talented young actress. And um, she she came in on our our, our edition uh, list, and so I just Googled her, and she had a website up with like a bunch of samples of shorts that she'd been in, and I saw all of her shorts, and I was like, every short she kind of embodied some aspect of Caitlin, so I knew before she even came in on audition that I wanted her for the lead, and I'm really glad, you know, that's one of the great things about kind of shooting indie films is is we kind of get to cast who we want. And um, when we had this at a studio, like they were saying, you know, you have to cast a big name, you know, white actress for the lead role. And, you know, as a as an ex, not you, you're never an ex actor, as somebody who studied acting growing up and moved to New York to be an actor. Um, you know, I was there in a time when diversity and casting was just not a thing. Like my agent told me that I was an ethnic Michael J. Fox type. And I'm like, that's awesome. Everybody likes Michael J. Fox. And she's like, no, people don't write roles for like for ethnic Michael J. Fox. It's like, if you rapped or played basketball, we could cast you, but we don't know what to do with you. So, you know, I've been on the other end of the casting kind of quandary. And, um, you know, I just know that there's a lot of great talent out there of all ethnicities, but people don't automatically look at that pool of actors and actresses when they're looking at their leading roles. So. Um, I wanted to find the best person for the role, but also I looked into that pool of of diverse actresses and was so fortunate to find Courtney. Well, I, I think for me, she really sold it um, with her relationship with her father. I thought that that yeah. um, is the thing. And I didn't know about It Follows, but that's one of my favorite horror films, just yeah. well, indie horror films, say, of the last decade. I think it's just, it's uh, remarkably original and frightening and uh, anything body horror always gets me. But um, but yeah, no, I, I yeah, I think when it comes to independent film, which I've been covering for decades now, it seems like there was never, you know, diversity was never an issue. It's like these that's where these stories flourish. I think that Hollywood is sort of getting, you know, to to, you know, realize. And I think that like to me, I always say to friends, it's like, look, um, the color that Hollywood loves more than anything is green. They love yeah. money. Right. And I feel like that there's that there is value in appealing to wider audiences. I yeah. just think that's simple. So but I think an independent film um, at least has been fortunate enough to not be burdened by, you know, the Hollywood going after huge dollars. Um, what are some of the tell me about some of the challenges in making this like, um, you know, doing a smaller indie horror film has to come with challenges, um, yeah. whether it be fewer days to shoot, less time to rehearse, less budget for uh, effects. Uh, although I'd say uh, the jump scares, you got me several times. Um, yeah. <laughs> so thank you for that. But but what were some of the challenges in doing this um, ind independently? Yeah, I think probably the biggest overall challenge was the the scope of the film, um, because I think, you know, at first when we, when, cause we shot in Baton Rouge, which, which Louisiana, which was a great place to shoot. And they were so amazing and welcoming, but um, I had scaled back a couple of the really bigger set pieces in the script. Cause I knew we were doing this for a lower budget, but, and I tried to trim some locations, but it wasn't until we were down there really location scouting that I realized um, that we were going to have some pro problems. Cause we had a lot of, a lot of scenes take place at a lot of different locations. So usually, you know, if you're doing a doing an indie, you know, film, you kind of keep your locations to a bare minimum. Um, you know, preferably like one house with a couple of exteriors. But we had a lot of um, a lot of locations, and we had like, you know, animals. We had mice and crows and rain machines, and so um, yeah, there were just there were a lot of things that I had to kind of rework on set as we were filming because. 
either the locations that we were able to 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 lock weren't quite um, what we needed for it to shoot it the way I wanted to. So a lot of it was just kind of being in the moment and day by day. Like sometimes we'd lose a location or something would happen and we couldn't get a location and we'd have to just rearrange our schedule like mad, mad. Um, so it, it was really just, I think a lot of, we had a lot more of the, that, those kind of challenges, like shooting wise, as far as, I think locations is probably our, our biggest challenge and like all the location moves that we had um, was our biggest challenge. Well, um, I, I have to ask you this. They say, you know, don't work with animals or children. So this crow is this, you know, recurring thing. Th th yeah. This crow shows up at the worst possible times, you know. Um, yeah. How is there a crow wrangler? Did you yeah. have like a model? Like, did you have like an animatronic crow? Like, how did you deal with a crow having to look at the, like, I, I, I'm I'm dying to just find out like, you know, okay, working with puppies. Okay. I get it. Dogs, uh, horses, a crow. What, what was it like to work with a crow? Yeah. No, we had, we had a, we had a great, great animal wranglers on set and uh, for the crow and for, we had mice as well. Um, it's funny because the mice actually, the mice actually hit their marks a lot better and did, did exactly what they were supposed to do. Uh, the crow, the, the crows were great. It's just, the funny thing is, they're um they're very um headstrong <laughs> and uh so there was a scene where there's a crow outside of a window sitting and and Courtney and one of our other characters is looking out the window at the crow and we needed the crow to fly in and then sit there for enough to look at the window so we could get a good shot at it and then fly out and that took us forever like that crow it would it would land and then it would start just wandering around, <laughs> not looking at the window. And and um, I realized when I was looking back over the footage to kind of find the right shot that I had our poor actors and actresses like they had to stand in that window probably for like 45 minutes straight, which I didn't realize because I was so focused on the crow. And, you know, it's kind of at the point where we're like, we're going to have to go with one of the other shots if we don't get it this time. But it's like we need the shot. Um, so they were great and friendly on set but they are divas man they don't <laughs> they, they they um they'll fly when they want to <laughs> they're they're definitely frightening creatures um tell me about uh obviously either james wan taught you well or you through osmosis learned a lot from him can you talk about um having worked with james wan like what what you learned from your experience in in working together uh, well, you know, I I didn't work a lot with James um, when him and Glenn came on to uh, Final Destination because I was still working at New Line in New York. Um, I got to visit the set, and I'm certainly huge fans of their work. So um, I've studied their work immensely. Uh, but a lot of my experience has, has come from just being on sets. Um, I've been very blessed to pretty much at least visit sets for for all the films that have been made of mine. So I've got to watch every type of director working. Um, and that's been very helpful. And I did a short as well, but the funny thing is, no matter how much you think you know, until you actually do it, you don't realize all the stuff that you don't know, because uh, you really have to do it to to really understand the um, the magnitude of, of work that has to be done. And, um, you know, I, I got my storyboards done and had my crew up and I'm like, I'm ready to go. And then I got down there and all of a sudden, you know, problems start coming up and you have to like put out fires left and right. And, you know, you obviously have your, producers and your team working with you to help kind of buffer the director from a lot of that stuff. But when you're on a smaller set, especially somebody like me, I tend to like worry a lot about everybody. So I want to make sure, you know, everybody in the crew is happy and everybody in this is going on and everything is safe and everything is this. So I, that was a thing that I had to try to get out of my head for a bit, you know, not, not to the point that I don't care about people, but just letting the other people like handle the side stuff. Um, which is not in my nature at all. I'm very like micromanaging to make sure everybody's okay. So um, to be in a position where I had to push that down as much as I could, so I could just focus. Um, that was, that was a challenge for me personally that, you know, the next time I'm still going to be, you know, the same old me, but it's just the next time I'm not going to worry so much about everything else. Cause I, I have to trust, you know, that other people are going to just do what they're supposed to do. And um yeah, deliver. And they did, you know, they de they definitely did. Well, um, as a screenwriter now sitting in an, the director's chair, is there anything you can say about um, from being behind the keyboard to in 
um, to being in the director's chair, like what the what that transition is like, and and maybe some advice from those writers considering making that leap. Well, I, the funny, I think the biggest, because I always kind of step back and try to process what I've learned. And the funny thing is like, I, I definitely, there were so many times where, where I've, you know, I've written a script and then the film that comes out doesn't look or feel any, doesn't feel like I had envisioned the movie in my head. And so I was always like, well, when I direct, you know, this will be like my vision on the screen. And it's funny because you do have to take into account, like, you know, a director does have their vision, but you do have to take into account things like budget and locations and all this technical stuff. So even the movie that I directed doesn't look like the movie that I saw in my head when I first wrote the movie, because it was imagined at a much bigger budget. Um, but I think I definitely say that it's something that if you want to see as close to your vision as, as you write on the screen, you should do it. I think the key is to realize it takes a team to make a movie. So, you know, you have to get surround yourself with a, a great team like I did that knows what they're doing um, and shares your vision to try to bring your vision to the screen. And you have to kind of be willing to, you know, kill some of your bit darlings because um, there were some things that I wanted to do that we just couldn't do. And, you know, I found myself on set like there were a couple of times I had to rewrite an entire scene just because we were losing hours. And it's like, well, I have to make sure this connects to stuff later. So, um, it's a it's a different process. Um, you learn you learn to kind of let let go of the script to a degree. Like the script is certainly important in the blueprint, but you know there are times on set where you know an actor would think of something and I'd be like, "That's great, let's do that." Um, so it's a it's a it's a fun process. It's it's very very hard. All my director friends are probably like, "No crap, it's hard." But um, you know, I got a little cocky because I'd been on so many sets and I did a short, and that the short was like you know was like butter doing that. So, you know, doing a feature is, um, it's a lot of fun, but it's a lot of, it's a lot of hard work, so. Well, um, Jeffrey, uh, now's the time where I have to thank our sponsor, Storyblocks. If you go to storyblocks.com slash film threat, tools for filmmakers that are really useful. I'm a user of Storyblocks, so check them out. Um, and Jeffrey, I wanna thank you for doing the show, but I gotta ask about that beautiful piece of art that's behind your head. Do you mind if I ask? Oh like, no, it's, it's a, um, yeah, it's a um, picture of Storm from the X-Men. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. And the artist is Sager, S-A-Y-G-E-R. And I go to a lot of um, comic cons and horror conventions. And um, I saw him there and he was he's a great artist and he was also cute. So I was like, I gotta buy something from him. <laughs> Just to be honest, I don't. Uh -huh. um, but, um, he, he he storm is like my favorite you know my favorite um cartoon character i just think i love her so and he did a great great drawing of her so well hopefully comic cons will come back i, I don't know you if know, you know, i miss the festivals so much All uh, the festivals, the I'm, festivals. I'm, <laughs> and we just got word that sundance is all going to be online it's just going to be a virtual film festival now, Sundance. So uh, we'll see. I think um, I'm looking forward to 2021 being being a, a, a better year. Better year. Oh, uh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I'll see you at Monster Palooza. I don't know if you go to Monster Palooza. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that show. Yeah, it's a great it's a great con here in, in Los Angeles. So yeah, I'm looking definitely looking forward to getting back out there to the conventions because that's a you know it's. I guess it'll, it's a little different now that I'm directing something. It's, it's going to be a little funny because I'm used to just being the writer. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's funny because, you know, that's what I love about horror conventions. It's like, you know, the fans like no writers there. So they get excited to meet everybody involved in the creative process where, you know, as in Hollywood, it's usually like the actor and the director that people know, and then they don't know anybody else. So it's, it's, it'll be fun. It'll just be fun to get back out there again. Yeah, well, the writers are the unsung heroes. If you we, we, we are, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Jeffrey, thank you so much. Uh, Don't Look Back is out in drive-ins. It's on video on demand, and it's a horror film that you need to see this Halloween. Uh, this uh, a 31 days of horror for me. It's it's a month-long yeah. celebration. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, glad, I'm really um, I'm, you know, excited to be talk to you today, and I'm glad that you enjoyed the film. And yeah, it's like we still got a lot of. I'm I'm gonna probably stretch Halloween into November, you know, just to, <laughs> just to keep focused on the fun stuff. <laughs> well, 
this whole year 2020 has been like Halloween, right? I know. It's, you it's know? been a horror show. <laughs> yeah, the year is cosplaying as a dystopian future. We're just yeah. we're in a dystopian future. It's crazy. Um, yeah. Jeffrey, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you, and stay safe and be well, okay?